Hello everyone, um, my name is Jennifer Miller and I am a PhD student in Korean studies at the University of Edinburgh. As you'll have seen on social media, the Scottish Centre for Korean Studies is currently running a series where people can find out more about Korean studies at Edinburgh University, including details of the academics in the department, current research students, the postgraduate degrees that are on offer and individual course modules. Today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sangpil Jin, who is a teaching and research postdoctoral fellow in Korean studies here at Edinburgh. Dr. Jin received his PhD in Korean studies from SOAS, University of London, and his research interests include modern Korean history, diplomatic history, imperial history, and the international relations of East Asia. He has very recently published a monograph entitled Surviving Imperial Intrigues, Korea's Struggle for Neutrality Amid Empires, 1882 to 1907, which was published by the University of Hawaii Press. The book explores how successful Korean neutralization could have radically transformed the balance of power equation in East Asia, arguing that, although never implemented, Korean neutralization had the potential to succeed during the British occupation of Komundo between 1885 and 1887. Further pointing out that neutralization has recently resurfaced as a possible option for a unified Korean state to preserve its strategic flexibility amidst the US pivot to Asia and China's re-emergence as a potential hegemon in the region. In addition to his own research, Dr. Jin also contributes to the teaching of a number of postgraduate modules. So thank you very much for joining me today. In terms of your experiences as a postdoctoral fellow here at Edinburgh, um, obviously this will have been a bit affected by COVID, but can you describe a typical day for you if a typical day exists, you know, in terms of sort of usual tasks? And then I guess, what would one piece of advice that you could give to a new postdoc B? So I work every day, uh, but uh, recently because of the uh, upcoming conference, I have been spending majority of my time preparing for this conference. But other than that, my usual daily routine would be um, researching, uh, writing an article, or in the case, or uh, at least or reviewing the book, uh, revising the book manuscript, which I had to do until um, quite recently, before it gets before this was published. And I would prepare for classes, le lectures and tutorials, and etc. And uh, the remaining of my time, I would uh, spend time reading books or articles related to my research. So, um, yeah, and I guess for my future successor, I think, I don't think there's a one, uh, there's a one like um, um, equation that fits for everybody. But I think that the key is how to be flexible, how to uh, learn to work with others, which is always challenging. And regardless of your major or your interest, I think uh, it's kind of expected nowadays that you need to maintain interdisciplinary and cross-regional perspectives, whether it's Korea, China, Japan, or any country. So, and that's one of the reasons why I think I developed recently strong interest in global history as well. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so, yeah, now just turning back to your recently published monograph, uh, Surviving Imperial Intrigues, congratulations on the recent publication of that. Um, so it would be great to hear about your book in a bit more detail, particularly some of the key themes and messages that you would like readers to take from the book. So my book focuses on neutralization of Korea from 1882 to 1907 and why this periodization? This is because I deliberately chose this, uh, this period where neutralization proposals were suggested, uh, funnily enough, first by Japan, 
uh, but later on it was picked up by both Koreans and Europeans and alike and others. And why it stopped in 1907? Well, that's because um, the Gojong, Korean emperor, he sent a special delegation to the Hague, which was held in 1907. And delegates from around the world met in Hague to discuss, among other things, um, disarmament and, uh, and issues pertaining to international relations. So Gojong at that time thought that uh, this was perhaps very useful opportunity to sue for in major powers interest in Korean independence. And although my book does focus on neutralization, uh, it also deals with Korea's bilateral ties with major powers, in this case, um, China, Japan, um, Russia, Britain, US, and to, uh, to, and to a less extent, France and Germany. Now, China, of course, during this period was not considered global power. However, from the perspective of Joseon Korea, because uh, Joseon Korea maintained centuries of tributary relations with uh, Qing China, it, Qing China, uh, at least from the East Asian perspective, was still considered a major power, at least until it was defeated by Japan in the Sino Japanese, in the first Sino Japanese war in 1895. So that's why I devoted a considerable time in, for example, uh, dissecting relations with Joseon Korea and China. And it also, well, apart from the uh, discussing um, Korea's ties with these countries, because my book is divided into three hegemonic rivalries, Firstly, Sino-Japanese, briefly Anglo-Russian during Britain's occupation of Komundo from 1885 to 87. And, also, and, and later on, um, Russo-Japanese rivalry and, uh, all the way up to the Russo-Japanese war. So and because neutralization was affected by different influencing factors. So for example, we have military uh, military uh, strength, uh, loans, uh, infrastructure such as railways, telegraph lines, factional conflicts, and others. So even for those who have no interest in or little interest in Korean neutralization, they can still use my book as a guide to understand how periphery state, in this case Korea, strive to strive to maintain its uh, admittedly very fragile sovereignty in the age of high imperialism. And um, so for that reason, I think my book can be a good comparative study for those who are uh, doing imperial history or who want to understand relationship between periphery and core states and how core states uh, strive to maintain balance of power in this very important uh, geopolitical hotspot Korean Peninsula uh, during this period. And you mentioned briefly how neutralization has resurfaced as possible option, and that's true. In fact, at the height of the uh, another North Korean crisis of a couple of years ago, on the early years of uh, President Trump's presidency, there was interesting commentary published by the then Harvard professor and also ex-British Foreign Office diplomat, Roderick uh, Mekpakor. And in that commentary, he argued that uh, perhaps uh, suggesting to China uh, permanent neutralization of the Korean Peninsula can be a good option by the US to denuclearize uh, to, uh, Korea, uh, North Korea, and, but also to even uh, bring about the end of the North Korean regime. And he suggested neutralization because um, he realized that uh, China uh, uh, justifiably be very worried if, let's say, uh, unified Korea uh, still hosts US military presence. Imagine, for example, Mexico or Canada decides to host Chinese military base. And we know how the US reacted to Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba. So we have to uh, 
so in delicate matters like this, you know, we ha- I think we need to know how to uh, maintain balanced perspective. It's not black and white. It's not about, okay, uh, one country wins, the other country must lose. And I think we have already entered, in my view, China US bipolarity, not just in Asia Pacific region, but increasingly around the world. And there have been scholars who have been um, saying that we are living in bipolarity. And I should also mention that this uh, new tradition of Korea was also suggested by former Singaporean diplomat and scholar. Uh, his name is, uh, uh, Okay, I, I, I forgot his name, but he also uh, talked about neutralization as, a, as an option. And I should also mention that uh, this has been mentioned within South Korea as well. And I had the privilege of listening to uh, neutralization presentation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in South Korea. And because this uh, academic in South Korea, in Seoul National University, where he's based, he was invited to give a lecture. So clearly, if even uh, the conservative pro-US Ministry of Foreign Affairs in South Korea is interested in this idea, or maybe at least some, at least some of them, at least some of the diplomats may be interested. And this presentation revealed that even the Americans, during the, for example, during the Korean War, under the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower, uh, toyed with the idea of neutralization. And in the, my book also briefly mentions how Afghanistan uh, was also mentioned uh, as uh, turning, basically turning it into modern day Belgium state by no, no, none other than, than US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And I could go on, go on, go on, on and on and on why neutralization is still useful. But the, the thing is that I, humbly suggest that neutralization is a very important topic and is increasingly feasible, even for, from the perspective of conservative South Koreans or Americans alike. Yeah. You know, it sounds, it sounds really interesting. I think it's interesting how, you know, sort of a research project initially based on historical circumstances um, arguably has applicability in more modern. Um, so that's that's great. Um, and I guess now turning to the more practical aspects of getting the book um, from research project through to monograph. Um, how did you find that process? Were there any key challenges at all? Uh, yes. So initially, I had to send my cover letter to publisher, University of Hawaii Press, to lay out the case for my book. And the editor came back and he liked it and he sent, he asked me to send the whole draft, which I did. And then it first passed the in-house evaluation. So they have this committee within the University of Hawaii's Center for Korean Studies. After committee members said, okay, this is a good idea. Then they passed on, on to two external reviewers who gave me extensive feedback. So I had to revise my book based on their comments. And once I'm done with the uh, review, I send them back to the to the editor. And then once the editors, the external reviewers were okay with it, uh, they then pass on to University of Hawaii Press. And after University of Hawaii Press said, okay, this is a good idea, I was able to draw a contract. And uh, so the whole process, I think it took me uh maybe about around four years maybe yeah so uh so so i mean it was challenged but it was uh, maybe because it's based on my phd Mm. uh is i think it's easier than i thought i'm not saying it was easy but it was easier than i thought because i did not have to start in a blank state slate Yeah. yeah yeah Oh, that's great. And um, I guess the last question uh, for today is just turning to some of the courses that we have here at Edinburgh. Um, You mentioned that you've taught on a number of those. 
are there any subjects that you particularly really enjoy teaching? Um, and I guess the other thing is that in Scotland, as far as I'm aware, there isn't an undergraduate degree in Korean studies. So, you know, there's possibly students that are interested in studying the masters in Korean studies that might not have a background uh, in that field. I didn't personally before I started. Um, so when students are choosing elective modules, what would you advise them to consider? Um, so uh, for those who don't speak Korean or possess very limited knowledge of Korean, they should take um, our modules in Korean language. It's taught by native uh, expert Korean language instructor. And I would also advise that they take courses on um, modern East Asian history course, which covers basically Japan and Korea and some about China as well. They can also take courses on um, politics and international relations of East Asia, because this course will equip them ability to contextualize Korean Peninsula and its neighbors in um, cross this uh, cross disciplinary and regional perspectives. I think another course that I think many students may find interesting is um, exploring contemporary Korea through films and dramas. So I realized that maybe not all, but significant uh, minority of students who are interested in Korea or Korean courses have at least some interest in maybe in Korean cinema or Korean drama or K-pop. I mean, I don't blame them. I also like BTS, for example, you know. And uh, so that course would be interesting because students will be able to watch their favorite dramas or uh, movies. And then each week they can discuss their uh, with classmates and the instructor about their impressions on, say, um, class society in South Korea um, or other social issues that you can detect by watching Korean dramas and films. And um, I guess one of, the interest, uh, one of the good aspects of that course is that students were allowed to choose different assignments. So they did not have to write essays uh, for midterm. So they could choose, for example, make video essays policy briefs and others. And I think that's one of the in major strengths of um, courses at Edinburgh, Korea related courses, because students can, um, uh, can, uh, can complete what, what I guess what you call non-traditional university assignments, because Traditionally, when we think about university assignment, we think about essays or literature reviews, which you can do, but at Edinburgh, if you take career related courses, you can also do video essays, policy briefs, and other types of assignments, which I think is not very common in um, other Korean studies courses in, in Britain. Yeah. No, I would definitely agree with that. Um, it was one of my favourite parts of the MSc was doing the video essays. So no, I, I would definitely agree with you on that. Well, this has all been really interesting and I think very useful for people watching. So uh, thank you very much, Dr Jin, for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.